Let's take our course books and turn toward the back. This hymn, How Great Thou Art, if you do a comparison between it and what's in our hymn book, you'll see that this one has some other verses that I really like that were part of the original, but for whatever reason not included in our hymn book. So that's why it's here. How Great Thou Art. O Lord Most High, Thou Holy God and Savior, Thy power and might are more than tongue can tell, but greater far the love that planned salvation and saved the lost from sin and death and hell. O God of love, O God of Calvary, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. In all the world there is no one like Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Once far from God, an alien and a stranger, a hope bereft, a sinner lost and lone. But Jesus came to rescue from the danger, to give us life, he sacrificed his own. O God of love, O God of Calvary, how great thou art, how great thou art. In all the world there is no one like thee, how great thou art, how great In mercy rich, in love and grace abounding, when we were dead in trespasses and sins, thy only Son for us was freely given. How great thou art, in thee our life begins. O God of love, O God of Calvary, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. In all the world there is no one like Thee, how great Thou art, how great take our Bibles and look together in Proverbs chapter 2. And my text for this hour is from verse 12 down to verse 22. I want to speak with you about the way of evil. We'll probably not get all the way through this, but as the Lord directs, we see primarily on verses 12, 13, 14, and 15. The way of evil. Here we find again these words of the Father to the Son. And as we're looking at this, these would be the instructions of God the Father to His Son. What would it have been for our Lord Jesus Christ to come into this world, being God of very God, and yet living? among wicked fallen sinners. It was necessary that he do that in order to work out that righteousness that God the Father required. In order for him to be just and declare righteous sinners that he had chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world. So this is not simply a script of a play 
like someone would look at this and say, okay, I can play the son. Let me go through this script and learn my words, and then we'll have the play, and everybody will go home afterward and be a good play. Now, this is reality. We're talking about a holy and just God. And here we see not only just how holy and just he is, but just how wicked and depraved we are. When I said the way of evil, were you thinking of the world out there? Or were you thinking that's what's in here, the way of evil? That's how we need to think. And I run into so many people so often that keep talking about this. Can you believe how wicked the world is? And the Lord has directed me more times than not to pause and say, have you ever considered the wickedness of your own heart? Those things that you think that have never been exposed to the world, that were they exposed, you would be denounced as just as evil as the very ones you're criticizing out here in the world. And if it took the Lord Jesus Christ coming and working out this righteousness that God required on our behalf, that tells us that it's not in ours, our hands to be able to, to do to satisfy holy God. It's in his hands. So think of that as we read here, going back up into verse 10. Think of the son. That's who's addressed here in verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words. And that eternal counsel of God the son received this instruction, what he was to do and what he was to accomplish in coming to this world. And it took the very wisdom of God when wisdom, verse 10, entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul. We're not just talking about working out an outward righteousness, but his very soul was made an offering for sin. He had to bear that sin in his soul, the curse of it, the condemnation of it. It was unto death. But it says there in verse 11, discretion shall preserve thee and understanding shall keep thee. For the Lord Jesus Christ to come in this world, be born of a virgin and, and be a man in this world. He was tempted in all things, yet without sin. It was necessary that discretion preserve him and understanding keep him. We fail every day when challenged by even what's out there in the world. You can get up in the morning and say, I'm gonna live for God's glory today. And the first thing that happens, phone rings or somebody says something to set you off. And what do you do? Well, you, you react. Well, there goes that proposal for the day. So we understand what it must have been for our Lord Jesus that was daily faced with the contradiction of sinners against himself and yet never uttered a contrary word in reaction, but more importantly, never had an evil thought in reaction. That he, by this discretion, by this wisdom that was manifest in and through him, that is what preserved him, the very spirit of God in a body, God in a body, understanding, keeping him. And again, I, I know some treat that lie and say, well, he was God, so what do you expect? No, he was a man that had to be utterly cast upon his father in every way to trust him so that in the end, this justice, this righteousness that he worked out would be satisfactory to God himself. I know his enemies scrutinized him in every way. And Christ asked them at one point, well, for what good work do you stone me? For desire to stone me? Why, why do you desire to kill me? What, what is the, the crime? 
And they had to answer, it's, it's not for a good work, but that you, being a man, make yourself equal with God. That was their contention. They couldn't understand, couldn't see how God could be in the flesh and walking amongst them. But I'll tell you, if that had not been, there would be no salvation. People say, well, live so that people can see Christ in you. They didn't even see Christ in him. In fact, they were offended by him because in him was that perfect righteousness that they sought to attain unto by their own works. And yet here he was outside of their religious system, outside of their upbringing, the perfect man. You can understand why they were jealous. School, when you were in school and that smart A student transferred in to the class, everybody there is jealous of that person. Why? Because they're smart. <laughs> they, they compare themselves with one another. And especially our Lord Jesus Christ telling these that except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, when he said except it exceed, he's not talking about trying hard because these folks tried hard. They took that law seriously and they went about establishing, trying to establish their own righteousness. But here was righteousness itself staring them in the face. And they didn't know what to do with it. It condemned them. The light shone on them. But this was necessary for our Lord Jesus Christ. And this discretion, that's what we're reading here in verse 12 now. This, this wisdom, this discretion, when it says to deliver thee, from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, the keeps going back to verse one, the son. So he was constantly faced with this way of evil. Man is an italic from the evil one, the way of the evil one, from the man that speaketh forward things. So not only did Christ have the scrutiny of these enemies, there was Satan who stood against him, but more importantly, God himself was scrutinizing his son. Just like that lamb in the Old Testament that had to be without spot and without blemish and was tied up for those three days before it was to be offered up in a sacrifice. The son himself was under this scrutiny. But it was that wisdom in him, that discerning, that discretion, that understanding given him that enabled him to, as it says there, deliver him. They set all kinds of traps and snares for him. Many times when they came to confront him, it was to ensnare him and to bring him down. So I believe verse 12 is describing that from the man that speaketh four things who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil and delight in the forwardness. That word forwardness means the perverseness of the wicked, of the wicked one whose ways, this is how it's described in the, the way of evil, whose ways are crooked, and they forward in their paths. But again, to deliver thee from the strange woman. In scripture, the strange woman is false religion. It's like a prostitute that goes out and tries to get people to follow her, dresses herself up and looks for addicts to come in and enjoy her services. That's false religion even the stranger which flattereth with her words. 
type of preachers that represent these religious organizations, flattering with their words. But are those which have forsaken, verse 17, the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. You can see here it's that we're talking about things spiritual that draw so many out of the way, following after this strange woman. In Revelation, she's called the great whore. Spiritual adultery is none other than turning from Christ and his glory to another. You can see why here those that follow that path, the way of evil, it's called, follow a strange woman. For her house inclineth unto death. What's that house that she's built? It's a house of works, of traditions, of ceremonies. And her paths unto the dead. There's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the and thereof are the ways of death. None, none that go in unto her return again. If the Lord gives somebody up to follow after the way of Cain, because you could say that, here we're studying the way of evil, the way of Cain, he was never granted repentance. And he lived a long life, but there was no coming back. That's why this is such a serious matter when people who come sit for a while and hear the gospel of Christ and his glory and his finished work, and then they think, ah, oh, I feel a little more comfortable over here in this house. What's in that house? Well, it's a house of prostitution. They may not admit it, but they're being solicited. It's a house of works, of ceremonies. They like the smell of the incense, everything that's being offered up on their altars of, of works and prayers and fastings and everything else that goes on in that house. But beware, it's like the writer to the Hebrews says that any that leave this way of Christ and his finished work and go another way, there remains no other sacrifice. It's serious. None that go unto her return again. Neither take they hold of the paths of life. But here, again, addressed to the Son, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men, men is an italic, and keep the paths of the righteous. What was the one reason why the Lord Jesus Christ came in this world? It was to take sinners in their condemnation and work out that righteousness on their behalf so that God might be just and declare them righteous. That, that was his whole reason for coming, that thou mayest walk in the way of good men. How, how do you take sinners and make them good? Because that word good means like God, God likeness. But it's only going to be through the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ, what he accomplished and his sacrifice unto death, paying their sin debt. And for that, verse 21, the upright shall dwell in the land, and the perfect shall remain in it. That's talking about what Christ would accomplish, this son described here, accomplished for the salvation of these. But what's the contrast? Verse 22, the wicked shall be cut off upon the earth. And who are the wicked? Most people think, well, that's those bad people out there. It's talking about people, just like it describes there in verse 17, who've forsaken the God of their youth and forgotten the covenant, the covenant of grace of how it is that God can save sinners. They, they've walked away from it. And I'll tell you, anything outside of Christ and his righteousness, the Bible describes as unrighteousness. I know people say, well, at least they're churchgoers. It doesn't matter. You might as well be out there in the world robbing banks. There's, there's no difference. These are robbing God of his glory, and these are robbing banks. So you lie, you cheat, you steal. You're a murderer. You're an adulterer. That's how the scriptures describe it. The wicked shall be cut off from the earth. 
If we don't have this righteousness that Christ came and earned and established and God imputed when he finished that work at the cross, then we have no standing. We stand with transgressors, and it says shall be rooted out of it. People can hide behind the fig leaves of religion, but they can't hide for long. Can't hide for long. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these gathered. Pray that you would give us discerning hearts. We know just how great is our need. But more importantly, just how great is the Savior in that need. And that it is for such that he came to this world to live and die and rise again. Such sinners as we are. We pray that by your spirit our eyes would not be on any other than ourselves that we consider just how great is that work of salvation whereby you have bought us and by your spirit sung us that we might be of this number that stand with the Lord Jesus Christ and that righteousness that you have imputed our account is work alone so we look to you to bless during this first hour and ask for it your spirit to be our teacher. It's in Christ our dear Savior's name I pray. Amen. So the scriptures describe the whole world as lying in wickedness. You say, well, where did it all begin? Well, it's in the fall of Adam. When he fell, the entire world fell. Some people call it a mess up. No, it, it it didn't catch God by surprise. Before there was ever the fall, before there was ever sin in this world, there was the eternal Son of God that God the Father purposed to honor and glorify. And how so? By giving him sinners from out of a world that would yet fall, give them to his son, that his son might come and save them by working out that perfect righteousness on their behalf. Not only by a perfect life, because you have to remember the law of God, there's the precepts that had to be answered, but then there's also the penalty, which is the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, as we look at this particular portion, as I said, I want to come back and deal with just these first few verses in 12 through 15, and then next time we'll look at what it is to be delivered from that strange woman, how our Lord was delivered, how he stood outside of the tradition religion of, of his day and would not bow, would not be drawn in, even though men sought to bring him into agreement with them. That's, that's not how it works. This matter of salvation is God bringing the sinner into agreement with God and his way. How it is that he says. But first of all, here we see two things, the nature of wickedness. When it says there in verse 12, to deliver thee from the way of the evil. Notice the definite article, the evil. Our Lord prayed to his Father there in his high priestly prayer in John 17. He said, I pray not that the Father take those of his out of the world, but that he keep them from the evil. Our translation says from evil. But you look back in the original, there's an article, definite article. All that is evil. Some people look at it and say, well, that's Satan. Well, true. They say, well, that's the world. True. The whole world lies in wickedness. But how about being kept from the evil that we carry around in this flesh day and night? You can go isolate yourself away like some try to do. They, they go up on a mountaintop and build this big old 
construction monstrosity, and they say, I'm going to dedicate my life separated from the world. Well, as soon as you walk in and close that door, guess what? You've just brought the evil in with you. That's what a lot don't realize. The evil isn't just out there. The evil is in here. And this is what our Lord it wasn't just the outward performance of the law that was required. It was necessary that he be delivered from any evil within. That even a thought that was contrary to the will and the honor and law and justice of his father would have been enough to condemn him. Then it says from the man that speaks speaketh forward things. So there's things inward and there are things outward. But this way that is described here, the way of the evil, is what defines all of us as fallen creatures. And here's where I often have to pause and testify of how it is the Lord has taught me because intellectually, I could define sin. I went to school to learn different definitions and different types of ways that sin is defined. Even came into understanding of depravity. Academically, I could define what depravity is. I could still do it. But when it pleased God to stop me in my way and arrest me in that way, of really, it was a way of evil, but in my thinking, I was already in the way of righteousness, but it was, it was only a righteousness that I was working on, not of God. The Lord, by his spirit, showed me not just what depravity is, but how depraved my own heart is. Not was, but is. I live every day more conscious today of just how evil this heart is than ever before. You say, how can that be? Well, the more the light shines, the more the Lord teaches you of yourself, the more you find yourself like Isaiah crying out, woe is me, I'm undone. I dwell amongst the people with unclean lips. And when he said I dwell, that means he recognizes his own being unclean. So this is the path, this is the way, because that word in verse 12 there, the way, actually is a path. I remember being in Africa, and of course, forest trees all around where we were living, and you'd walk along, and all of a sudden you saw a path. Well, that's where you want to be on that, that path. That's the one well-trodden that gets you where you need to be versus being out in the woods. But you ever get off that path, suddenly now you, you're not going to find your way back. That's the word here that's used in verse 12, to deliver thee from the path of the evil. What it's describing is that way in which everybody walks. It's not the path of righteousness. We're not born in this world, walking on the path of righteousness, as are described in verse 13, the paths of uprightness. That's not how we're born. We're born in this way of evil. So it's describing there the course of life in which we're in and don't even realize it, don't even know it until the Lord is pleased to open our eyes, but our Lord Jesus was very conscious of this. When he came into this world, it was necessary that he be delivered. In other words, kept from going down this path of evil. That's why I know that those that say, well, he had to be a sinner just like we are in order to deliver those that are sinners. That's blasphemy. Here, the scriptures describe this son as being kept from that way of the evil. 
And there, then it says, from the man that speaketh forward things. When I read that word man, it is a word that's used all the way back in Genesis about Adam. In the Hebrew language, the name for man is Ish, and the name for woman is Isha. You just put a little A on the end of it, Isha, out of man. I find it interesting as a side note, today they're trying to get rid of all distinction and, and gender and sex. And so you can't refer, even can't even use the word man anymore. It offends. So you've got people trying to reinterpret the word. They're even coming out now with a translation of scripture, and I say buyer beware, but they're trying to remove any reference to gender, even with reference to God, because they say, well, what if, what if God is a she, not a he? And so you can see the perversion of men's ways, but I still have to chuckle a little bit because no one has mentioned the word woman. They talk about women's rights. Women, you can't say the word woman or women without the word man in there. And if you drop the word man off, you got, whoa. How's that working for you? But it's, it's again, to show here that anything we are in, 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 in our existence as sinners is from the man. When I read that from the man, when did this all start? For by one man, sin entered in the world and death by sin, so death has, has passed upon all men. So when you talk about the way of evil, you can't define it without defining the fall. What happened at the fall that has now caused everything to go the way it's going? Someone said one time, if you're wrong on the fall, you're wrong on it all. And that's the problem. People don't see themselves as the scriptures describe them, as sinners, as wayward, or as it's used here, forward. When did the man begin to speak forward things? Go back to the garden and read it. When they began to look on that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and saw that it was good, even though God had said it's evil not to partake. That word forward means perverseness. And that's what men do, even with the things pertaining to salvation and to God and to his justice and how he can be God and save sinners. They, they speak forward things, perverse things. They take the things that are clearly revealed and a perversion is to, to turn it into something evil. And our Lord certainly faced this when he was on this earth. He had to be delivered from the way of evil and from the man. When you see the man, anything that pertained to Adam and the curse from Adam, the fall, that speaketh forward things. We talk about just how perverse it is where people today take things that are good and speak evil of them, and then they take things that are evil and speak well. I think one of the greatest perverseness, as it speaks here of speaking, is those that preach that no matter how bad man is, there's still a little bit of good in there, and if we can just take and flame the fire of his will and get him wanting, then all be well. That's perverse speaking. Because there is no part of this flesh that has anything good to it. Even the Apostle Paul declared that as a converted sinner, one in whom the Spirit of God was, he said that in this flesh dwell no good thing. That's why I say the closer you come to the light, the more it's revealed just how evil this flesh is. The, re the reason why people don't see the wickedness or the sinfulness of their sin is because the light's off. 
they're feeling about in their blindness and they get up and stretch and feel like, well, I, I feel like I'm a child of God today. On what basis? It certainly can't be anything that is in us. And so the way of wickedness, the nature of this wickedness, it, it's what defines all of us as fallen creatures. People are worried about what's out here coming in here. If you stop, if you stop for a second and read from Mark 7 and verse 15, for example, Mark 7 and verse 15. This is where our Lord had to confront those that were in the evil way. Because they were all about washing pots and making sure that anything they touched, they, they cleaned up ceremony afterwards. And they thought by that they were keeping themselves pure. But they were living according to the tradition of men. And that's why our Lord said there in verses 6 and 7, he answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you, Matthew 7 and 6, hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why is the heart far from me? Because it's, it's depraved. It's not thinking to the glory and honor of Christ. How be it in vain. See, that's that house of the strange woman. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God. What's the commandment of God but to look to Christ alone as God's righteousness? Ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things like things you do. But look down in verse 15, the sum of it. There is nothing from without a man that entereth into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. There's the man. <laughs> it's here. Within us. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. There's a bunch of people still out here. They still think they're a little better than those out there that have never darkened the door of their religious places of worship. But they're just as evil as anybody out there, except for, and I say we are, except for that righteousness that the Lord Jesus Christ came and established and earned on behalf of his people. So this defines all of us as fallen creatures. And coming back to our text in Proverbs chapter 2, verse 13, it's described as a way of death. Who leave the paths of uprightness, who walk in the ways of darkness. Such are described as workers of iniquity scripture. If you're not in the way of righteousness, which is Christ, if he has not earned and established that righteousness or justice on your behalf and paid the sin debt to satisfy God's law and justice, then there is no other way but the way of unrighteousness, of iniquity. That's why the Lord said to the Pharisees, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Here it says, who leave the paths of uprightness. Of righteousness is what that is. To leave this path, to walk away, to go about establishing your own righteousness, it clearly describes here as the way of darkness. That's the proof. You say, well, how do I know Someone's still blind. Well, they're following this way of works. Righteousness, which is no way at all. They're feeling about in darkness. Until the Lord opens their eyes and grants light to see, eyes to see that they'll go that way. But the point I wanted to see, and we'll have to draw a line here and come back. Notice in verse 14, because I know people argue and say, well, what, what if they really want to 
be saved, but now God has it purposed. No, they rejoice to do evil. I don't know a person that's in works religion that doesn't like it. I'll tell you, if the Lord ever shows them the evil of it, then they will leave. They won't be able to tolerate it. But until then, people love what they do. That's why they're always telling you, you ought to come on over here, hear this speaker today, and you ought to come to this activity here. And they're just, they're high five who rejoice to do evil, but it's still evil. They delight in the forwardness of the wicked or the, their wickedness. Another way to read that. Whose ways are crooked. There's only one right way, and that's Christ. In the word righteousness, you have right. Everything else is crooked. It's crooked. And it says there in verse... 15, and they forward in their paths. Constantly wandering. A lot of people get a little unsettled in one place and they think, well, I'm going to go over here because I think I like this place better than that. And so they change places, but it's still a, it's still a forwardness, it's perverseness. But these are the things which our Lord Jesus Christ, when he came into the world, stood against. And that, that righteousness that God the Father required of him is the one that delivers us. It delivered him. He worked it out perfectly, but think of him as the high priest. That in working this out, it wasn't just for himself. It was for his Father, but was on behalf of sinners such as we are. So that me, now that I'm born in this world, and now that he's given me eyes to see, I look back and think that before I ever knew him, he had already set his love and affection upon me. Before I ever knew him, he had already worked this righteousness out and paid that sin debt. And oh, the joy when the Spirit was given, such a wretch as I am, to look to Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, but that which is of God by faith. We're going to draw a line there, and Lord willing, come back and look at the strange woman next time. What is that all about? I gave you a little bit of a hint already, but we'll get into it next time. All right, we'll meet back here in just a few minutes.